Hello, 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 welcome back. Hello and welcome back. It's Franz Canto here, cartoonist, illustrator, to talker. And um, I'm going to do another drawing. Today I'm going to draw. Let's see if you can. Okay. We'll go, we'll enter the Wayback Machine. Watch this. That's kind of creepy. Is she blonde? Is she tall? Is she dark? Is she small? Is she any kind of dream at all? No so, matter. the real star of the many loves of uh, Dobie Gillis is this fellow, Maynard G. Krebs. Let's try to. Uh, Brad, we can never thank you enough. Oh, sure you can. It'll only take you four or five hours. I figured that this the two of you could be sent an hour. You could pay me back what Papa cost me before dinner time. Get to work. It was an interesting uh, show. He had this you favorite... Do my share of the work. <laughs> that was his favorite line of work. So, um, why are we doing him? So, this guy, Maynard G. Krebs. This is the... This is probably going to be the... Um, the photograph, actually something similar to this, a three-quarter view. This is a Drew um, Friedman uh, caricature of him. It's really nice. This is the guy, right, Bob Denver, who played Gilligan in Gilligan's Island, also played in uh, uh, Dobie Gillis as Maynard G. Krebs. Uh, that's Zelda, um, <laughs> the girl that always used to run after Dobie. That's, that was Dobie. That's uh, Bob Denver and later in life. So he was born in um, 1935 and died in 2005. And uh, he was um, really, you know, Gilligan kind of took over his uh, career and um, sh overshadowed this period. But this character, he, I was always really interested, more interested in Maynard rather than Gilligan. Gilligan was fine, but I think he, he, he was sort of like, um, in many ways, more um, two-dimensional. So Maynard had sort of more, more dimensions to him, I think. That's a DC comic, Maynard, uh, Dobie Gillis DC comic, for goodness sake. The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. All right, so let's uh, let's get in, and we're going to have a look at this photograph here. So I've done a little thumbnail sketch, and um, just want to talk a little bit about the process uh, involved. So <clears throat> let's see the basic structure of the head. I'm if I if I see things like cheeks being pulled, you know, like this. Big features, right? Cheeks, mouths, lips, nose, ears, things like that. Then I know that they're things that, that are more relevant to play with. So what I usually do is start with a very th simple sketch that uh, describes the basic shapes, right, of the forms. And what else do I need to talk about? So we need to look at the eyes, the relationship between the eyes, the nose, and the mouth in this sort of a, that's a sort of a T-zone, I guess you'd call it. So in this zone, the relationships between these elements, the mouth, the nose, and the eyes are important because all of the structures, the basic um, muscles and tendons and things, little pulley systems, um, they all refer to each other. So everything has a, a, a point of uh, origin and a, and a range of influences. And this is what makes the human face so articulate. Not to say that animals don't have that level 
of articulation, it's just that they don't really use it. Okay, so uh, we use it to communicate with very subtle ways. All right, so the other thing I wanted to say is we're looking at probably a, there's a pin light coming in from this direction, sort of a side light, um, and that's going to break up the shadows. But basically, the shadows are coming in from a light source that's coming in from the right. So how, why are we thinking about the lighting rather than the details? It's because we're doing a dimensional drawing, okay? So, um, and we're using, we're doing it on tone paper, so it's more of a sculptural effect. So that's why we need to refer to the lights. Light needs to, light gives it more three-dimensional um, properties, as well as things like perspective. But there isn't very much perspective involved in, uh, in this drawing. So I've taken the opportunity to sketch up the thumbnail onto the tone paper and we're going to be using brown pencils black pencils and what's left of my white pencils these are quite these are soft pencils they're quite soft leads which mean they tend to break easily so you have to be careful about that all right so let's get into some some details here so um you will you you obviously everybody loves him you know Bob Denver as Gilligan um, it is he is an iconic character um, but I really you know I, I didn't I thought that the um, Gilligan's Island was a little bit formulaic for me and you know it really sort of the stories didn't really have enough um, variety for my my liking but they did have some nice cameos there which I enjoyed and it was you know it was I thought it was quite funny but Dobie Gillis had had a lot of uh, other uh, things that was almost kind of philosophical in a way even the the you know, his catchphrase, work, meant that, uh, you know, work was not the, the only thing that's uh, important in life. So it had a sort of a, <laughs> a weird philosophical construct, I guess. And the other thing, too, that the show, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, is all about, uh, you know, falling in love and um, all of that, all of what that means, you know, body image and although in my, you must remember it's 1959 to 1963. So the level of uh, social very low, okay? But even so, you know, to have somebody like a beatnik um, as, a, uh, as a main character um, which is kind of like um, a hippie with coffee, <laughs> I guess. Uh, it's difficult to explain. So it's just, you know, a, a free thinking soul. And that was really interesting in the early 60s because it kind of contrasted a lot of the ethical, you know, father knows best type of stuff sort of the ethical um, males that go to work, they have to go to work, they have to stand up, they have to go to war, they have to, all of these things that they have to do to be, you know, socially accepted. And um, Dobie Gillis was almost the opposite, although they, they did have, I, w I didn't, haven't seen all of this, the, the, the um, episodes, but they did have, uh, um, I think they entered the, the, uh, the army. But that doesn't mean anything because, you know, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of comedy comes from that. Look at Stripes, look at um, 
you know, but privates. Okay, so what I've got here is um, the main areas I want to focus on are the, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So there's some key elements here, um, and these are things that are more uh, felt than overtly noticed in in the reference material, the reference photograph. So we'll just uh, sorry. Take a little bit of a time. So. Um, the angle of things and you know caricature is really a matter of uh, simplification and exaggeration so i look at that as a double-sided coin so one gives way to the other one allows you to exaggerate if you can simplify the shape you can find a dialogue that works for you um, that works better for you in a simple argument, a simple drawing, rather than, you know, having to have everything composed with perfect um, uh, proportions, right? So it's not really, it's a portrait in a sense that you've got all of the relevant details in there. You're looking at all of the relevant details to describe the face, you know, the emotional aspects, the expressions, the micro expressions, little details, the lines that, that allude to thoughts and feelings. Because thoughts and feelings show up in the face as wrinkles and lines. And with a portrait or with a caricature, especially because you're looking at exaggerating things, taking things out of their own proportion, right? So that's the, that's the idea of um, caricature, to exaggerate this dialogue, to have certain elements shout and other elements whisper. And those are not the things that are... Um, that work in the photograph because photographs tend to be very um, non-committal. They don't commit. So with a caricature you have the ability to exaggerate uh, aspects and that makes it uh, a different proposal, a different sort of uh, concept. So I made the decision to make his eyes smaller. They're also um, angled in towards the nose. So all of this again, you know, these are lines that link up. So it's sort of a gestural composition of, of line work. The lines of round the eyes join up with the nose and they join up with the mouth, etc, etc. So everything has a sort of a rippling effect, like a pond cause and effect. And you have to make sort of judgments as to what is important in terms of, you know, scale and detail. A lot of this is sort of felt rather than seen, but you know, observation is the most important thing. So it's observation and interpretation of the stuff that you see of the Im image of the information. So it's sort of selective. Um, process which is really what illustration is it's uh, illustration is a you know it's a selective way of drawing to tell a story visually you know try to pack as much meaning and narrative into a single drawing or single image single illustration
Wow, that's some lovely um, muscles here. He's got a lot of... He, he, this guy is an actor. He's a comedian. He's a comic actor. And you can certainly tell that by... by his... Um, the muscles around his face. They're really built for communication. So these deep lines, these dimples. That uh, favor the communication um, elements. The biggest one is the mouth, of course. Okay, so to simplifying a certain I feel that he should have a few freckles I'm getting that because um, you know freckles are just uh, have a textural quality to them as well they they kind of look right it's also the cheekbones Okay, so noses are really interesting because you can get a chance to sort of oversimplify their shape and they still work. And that's what I'm looking for for this. So without a lot of the detail, some detail, but most of it is simplified and definitely changing the perspective of it so that you're looking down on it more rather than, you know, uh, head on. Okay, so now the mouth is interesting. I've got to be able to show enough muscle here. And balance it over the other side of the nose, where it's going to sort of pop out here. Okay, it's a bit higher, too high that. So it'll be up there. Put the shadow in. I should continue the shadow for the down there too, possibly. Mm. So there's a curvature of the lip and the muscle underneath the lip, quite pronounced. It's going to be nice um, to be careful of how much shading you put there because it's quite um, it's quite light. Okay. And we get into an interesting pencil's beautiful for describing hair, but you know, short hair, fur, beard. Really good because you can get it done quite quickly. So it's not much work. Work! sleeved sweatshirt thing that they put over it. Let's uh, cut it. Make sure that it doesn't um, look too short.
Okay, so we're going to get into the black pencil now and get into some details. Usually start with the pupils. In this case, because he's got blue eyes. Um, if this was a computer, you'd pinch right in, you know, you'd zoom in to be able to get a lot of sharp details in here. Because this is pencil, you don't have that ability, which could be as a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how successful you can be with with the details. Okay. So when you've got small details like this, you know, it's really quite difficult to to get into the corners and into those um, areas. So, uh, so you know, Sometimes you have to err on this side of um, simplification. Because the size just literally won't let you go into it, into the um, into the face any closer. But that also means, you know, like if you're working digitally, sometimes, you know, too much detail. It ends up becoming like an airbrush um, painting. So refer part to part, eye to eye, left eye to left eye, right eye to right eye, right? Comparing constantly, you know, bits to bits. Yes, that to that, that to that. Always look back and forth, right? Keep, you know, where you are. Don't, don't um, make things up. Always have something to refer to. It just you know whatever you're drawing right it could if you're drawing a, a a dragon for example and you think oh well it's you know, pure imagination in many ways it is but you know it helps if you ref if you can reference something that you know it could even just be um, information about the shadows falling on the form you know it could be um, the shape of certain things like a, a neck or a snout or something, you know. Um, if you look at a, a lizard or a crocodile or something, it could give your dragon more believability. If you can reference something that is more grounded in reality. So it doesn't change the design at all. It just gives the design more believability. Say, oops, there it goes. So he's got light eyes, which you know, gray or blue. And that means there's more iris showing. That means that there is more um, uh, what's what more light coming in. Okay, so if you had chocolate eyes like mine, you know, the, under certain lighting conditions, they'd be almost black.
Mmm, chocolate. Um, it's really interesting uh, to get into these areas around the eye, you know, because there's a lot of um, subtlety here. And I'm just going to swap over to the white pencil for a sec. I just want to explain something to you. So the white of the eye is only called the white of the eye. It's seldom white. So it's just shiny and reflective. So this is the sort of thing that you think about. It's giving the skin, the drawing, a more of a tactile feel. Because the modeling with the white pencil, for example, gives the drawing more shininess or smoothness or wetness or oiliness. So caricature is really an opportunity for exaggerating a lot of the things that, that you notice in drawing the face. It's not just establishing a likeness. <clears throat> if, if I get a likeness, great. But the exercise here is to draw and to learn from the drawing. So caricature for me is, is a way of exaggerating what you see in order to take better advantage of that. And to really, you know, notice those details and those small imperfections and wrinkles, etc. And play with them, exaggerate their importance. And in so doing, um, you know, create a new narrative, a new form of storytelling in the drawing, in the face. So you're thinking about, you know, <clears throat> highlights and things and it's a very tactile response. You're actually feeling like a sculptor, <clears throat> you know, with the, the, the three different pencils, the black, the brown and the white on toned paper so you can actually see the white pencil. So you're actually building up highlights um, very much like a sculptor would build up form that catch the highlight. You can see how nice and soft these are. They can build up, you know, white on white to, to gradually create a stronger impression. This is the cheekbone. I've spoken about that before. It's important to refer, even though sometimes in the reference it's not that strong or visible. It always gives your drawings a sense of reality, believability, because even though it's not there in the photograph, it should be there in the drawing. So drawings. Um, well, they can be photographic. You can do very photographic drawings, but I think that, you know, drawings are better if they tell you something more about the form or about the personality um, than the photograph can. Um, so it's, it's really more important to draw it than, you know, the photograph. Because... Well, as a drawer, you're learning more as you go. You're learning more about the importance of light and shade and, you know, what the details actually mean, what the wrinkles mean, the expression, all of these things. So even though he's got no freckles, really, the freckles kind of make <clears throat> sense. It's 
So I'm going to continue over here and then I'm going to go back into the hair, I think. I um, just want to get some some more contrast in here. The black, this black works quite well over the brown pencil. Um, I need it to be sharper. So the polychromos are quite hard. They're, they're much harder. The same quality pigment. So very dense pigment. But not as soft. So you wouldn't press very hard with uh, prisoner colors. With a polychromo you can press right into the paper. It won't break. Which is good because you need to get solid, more solid black. So I've simplified the nose here, the shape. Oops. Uh, that's an interesting thing. How are we going to fix that? See if I can get it with this. Work all right. So let's look at the relevance of how dark to make certain things and light to make certain things. Let's get in here with a got a Posca, get a paint pen, which is a little bit more opaque. Um, let's see if I can put these reflections. Let me just help out with the uh, shininess of the eyes. There's also a little bit of reflection in the underlid and a little bit in the overlid and this lacrimal again over there you clearly see um, the textural qualities of the highlights because they feel, you know, shiny, smooth, oily, all of these things. It makes a difference. Continue on. So I just want to um, say that I'm just uh, you have to be careful with lines, you know, and how you how you treat them with the the black pen or black pencil because not all things have that equality in a drawing. So even if uh, you know you have to look at the reference and sort of feel how. Uh, relevant it is to to make a dark outline and how dark that outline should be and the pencil gives you that ability to gradually build up form just nice and slowly so it it, it gives you more uh, contrast to the form and um, clarity it makes it a bit sharper
again, don't outline everything. Like, you know, in the photograph, his lips don't have very dark lines. You can hardly see them, in fact. So even these lines here, probably too heavy. So you know when I I love I love the fact that the brown is underneath the black, and it gives it a nice um, warmth. Um, if you just put the black on the grey paper without the brown pencil underneath, it tends to look very stark and um, cold. Okay, so. Here we go. Interesting. We need to build up darker tones here, but that is a shaggy, literally shaggy. Shaggy is actually based on Maynard G. Krebs. Hey, Scoob. So <laughs> it's kind of uh, interesting. Um, I think they are actually Bob Denver or Gilligan would have made an appearance probably in um, Scooby Doo. I can't remember. I'm, I seem to think that it. I mean, this could be a, another Mandela moment. Um, I seem to think that he made an appearance in Scooby Doo. So, I mean, people like you know uh, Don Knotts, for example. Another great um, character actor. He made a couple of appearances as himself. So, you know, I haven't checked the Wikipedia on um, Bob Denver, but I'm, I'm sure he may have, um, he may have done that. Certainly a major influence on Shaggy. And Scoob. I mean, they're both kind of a dog version of Shaggy, it really is. The first Ghostbusters. Take a bit of license with this. Um, just simplify a lot of the shapes. Actually, we should do that. Um, shadows coming down there, so we should really darken this um, a little bit, perhaps. Hmm. Leave it. Now we go into the hair. So we've got some hairs that are sharp and form shadows on the forehead. So we have to look at that. This is, uh, uh, late fifties, early sixties. Long hair was a very, very unusual thing to see. I mean, Dobie himself had this sort of a GI crew cut, which was a you know number one something or number two, it was very very short. Um, and of course, they didn't have beards then. This was a very unusual thing. But. Um, like uh, afros and mullets and things like that in the 60s and 70s and and so forth. Um, 
they were around so you know it wasn't something that was shocking to people it was just relevant to the time face um, Bob Denver it's nice and um, it's a nice pleasant Sunday drawing Maynard it's not work work it's fun so drawings are drawings should be fun drawings are fun they should be fun um, they shouldn't be a chore they should be more like a exploration of something that um, will give you a bit of a little bit of joy highlight on the top which I'll have to fix with the uh, white pencil and there's some textual qualities of the ear so the inside the ear is very reflective because it's a lot of oils are inside Right, now back into the form of the face. So I'm using the white pencil here, but I'm not coloring in. I'm keeping it on the lowdown, trying to establish the right amount of um, looking for texture, looking for the, the shiny bits, because that's why there is highlights there. It has a, a reason for being there. So you need to focus on that and the expense of changing the tone overall. Otherwise, the more highlights, the more white you put in, like what I did over on the ear, a little bit too much over here, it tends to flatten things out. So that's not what you want. You want them to be more rounded. Okay, more sculptural. Let's see if I can... Catch the light under here. The white pencil is very effective when it's right next to a shadow. 
it kind of stands out. The contrast is quite uh, interesting. The harder you press, the more chances it'll break, but you know, you're trying to establish um, more reflectivity in the skin, especially around the cheeks. Remember, you've got like a side light coming in right on the edge. And that gives it more three dimensional. So I'm going to balance that with a little bit of a side light on this side too. Uh, maybe do that. Okay. Hmm. It's interesting. Need to see that black pencils kind of tainted the uh, paper. It's okay. So right underneath the shadow, I'm putting that highlight, and that gives it like a uh, lip. You know, gives it that shelf that catches the light that's coming in from above. that out with a black pen as well I think again another sh stepping down of um, shelving of these forms that uh, catch the light if they stick out a little bit protrude from the face like this, uh, the chin that sticks out a tiny bit catches some of the light, like so. All right, so what can we do here? Get more mischief. I'm going to try to outline this um, and try to. Oh, there's a bit of black pigment dust. help out with the uh, details a little bit. This is a brush pen, so the ink is in the handle. So you get to sort of squeeze it out. Actually, it might be a bit low on pigment, on ink. It's got to squeeze it out to the, to the brush. Yeah. So it becomes more charged. So the black pencil is quite strong, but it's nothing compared to the ink. So the ink is just helping out with the contrast. So because I'm working tonally, I am pushing and pulling elements out of the toned paper. Um, one of the things I want to do is uh, maybe just help with the the outline, just the outer contour, if I can give it a more definite um, shape and thick and thin possibilities. Also the nose, just part of it, just to give it more roundness. Okay, so now I'm going to go around here. Uh, that didn't work. Um, so 
the idea is to create a um, stronger definition of form, which makes it stand out a little bit better from the background. So the, the outline is there with the black pencil, but this is just something that kicks it out even even more but the thing is you've got to be careful how much you outline Ribbon, name ribbon. I'm going to put Maynard G. Krebs on that because it's Bob Denver, but it's in, it's in character. I quite like this. I like his expression. I think I've got a, some some likeness. I don't know. What do you think? Does it look like him? Okay, so that's a little bit wet here and there and a little in parts. Um, this is another Posca, it's another paint uh, pen. Um, dries quite flat, which is handy because that's what we want. And um, it's not quite as sharp as the brush, but can give you a, the ability to cut into these little shapes. So I'm going to cut around them, not sort of up to them, because if I was cut up to them, guess what? They disappear. The same thing with uh, the thick and thin lines that I've got around it. So I want to sort of establish this negative space with this um, boxed frame device which gives you a sense of balance and composition but you don't want to do that at the expense of um, losing the definition or the contrast that you've established with the thick and thin lines around the forms might just get that with a thicker pin a sec. This is, believe it or not, this is my favorite part because you get a chance to revisit a lot of these beautiful shapes only in their negative aspect. So you see the shape around them and you're making um, reference to that. So it's sort of like drawing the line again, you know, and has a different uh, sort of effect. Okay, I'm going to try to lean across. I'll do it with this. Got to, <laughs> I've got to get over here on the left. I'm right-handed, so if I was left-handed, it wouldn't be a problem because you'd be going in the right direction, but I'm not. It's one of those times when you think, you know, wish you were ambidextrous, you go in any direction, and it's fine, you use either hand, and work on both sides of the illustration at once, I guess. I don't really know anyone that does, uh, that has that ability, so. Um, it's not really that important, as long as you can get to it um, without too much difficulty, should be alright.
So I had a friend come up with the idea of, um, as I misheard him, oh, Maynard G. Krebs, that's a good idea. And of course, they weren't talking about him at all. But, you know, he has an interesting, he has an interesting face. And I haven't seen too many people draw him. He's got a nice personality, you know. Um, it's inspiring. It's inspiring, makes you feel right. Oh, look what I've done there. Oh, well. Um, so they're very inspiring characters. A lot of these uh, character actors, they put so much um, work into their, the personality of the uh, character that they're de depicting. You know, um, and it becomes like so iconic. So if you think about uh, character actors like Mel Blanc, for example, who did all the voices for, you know, um, Warner Brothers cartoons. Um, you cannot imagine those characters without hearing their voices. They're so iconic. And, um, you know, these character actors that have beautiful comic timing and personality, they really make us care about these um, shows. Because the show itself doesn't mean much. It could be any kind of, and often is, you know, they they have so many crazy plots and subplots and things in these shows, but um, we care about them because of the characters, like, um, like him, like Bob Denver. This is another Posca marker, look they? Brush tip. So, because it's a paint pen, it's not going to react with the pencil underneath, which is good. It's going to give us a little bit of help with the white. Establish more sort of contrast. I might just actually build up that just a little bit. Hmm. Got a great face. I'm trying to get that sharpness of this um, highlight under the mouth. And there's a, a strong rubberiness, which is very interesting. Very flexible, incredibly flexible. You know, that's the thing about um, Bob Denver. His face is really, really flexible. You know, he has a lot of ability to express feelings and emotions. Alright, so I'm going to finish up. I'm going to put um, the name of the character here. Hopefully spell it right. Maynard G. Why is this? Um, so activate this. 
this again. Make it more um, opaque. It's better. K R E B S. There we go. It's quite nice. Um, bit smudgy on the paper outside, but I can't fix that now. All right, so I think that's all I can uh, really say about him. He's a really interesting uh, actor, very you know, lovely man, lovely personality. The two, two characters he played, obviously this is Maynard G. Krebs from Dobie Gillis, but uh, he also played um, Gilligan, so I can, you can definitely see, you know, there's a, a lot of compassion and um, flexibility. His face is incredibly rubbery and flexible. So he's got that beautiful big smile and open expression. And, um, you know, you can see that uh, in his um, in his looks. So it's a lot of... Uh, very, very compassionate person, Maynard G. Krebs. Um, and um, I think that's it. I think that's it by George. Um, okay, so I hope uh, I've enjoyed this uh, immensely. And uh, I hope you have too. I've learned quite a lot about uh, not just him, but uh, also the, the uh, lighting and form and personality, etc. So that's good. All right, this is uh, Franz Cantor saying to you, I'll catch you on the flip side.